We were never supposed to be in Hong Kong. Our story begins in a taxi cab on the way to Bangkok's Don Wang Airport. After a truly incredible month in Thailand, today our visas were up and we had to leave. Now I'm the kind of extremely annoying person who makes sure we arrive several hours early. This taxi could have broken down, somehow punctured all four of its tyres, it could have even caught on fire and we still would have been on time. But I'd rather sit in a nice air-conditioned airport enjoying their two hours free Wi-Fi than risk missing our flight. We'd be heading to Mandalay, Myanmar, a country in the midst of the world's longest ongoing civil war. Admittedly, I was more than a little nervous about this fact, but our research had assured us the place we were visiting was completely safe, more or less, hopefully, but we wouldn't even get that far. It turns out you need a visa to enter Myanmar. Oops. It was an expensive mistake. Not only did we lose our money on non-refundable flights and hotels, but we now had to book new ones for that very same day and with the few minutes of Wi-Fi we had remaining. So that's how we ended up in Hong Kong. And I mean, as far as mistakes go, this was a pretty good one. I've always wanted to visit Hong Kong, but we just didn't have the time or budget on this trip, so it was definitely a happy accident. And after so many hours sat down on a plane, the first thing we wanted to do was stretch our legs and explore. And what better introduction to the city than climbing Victoria Peak? We've just got off the road and onto the actual path now, so it feels a lot more like we're actually hiking rather than just walking uphill through the city. Now me and Danielle have got this weird thing where we try and not look at the view until we're at the top and it's at its most impressive. So most of my footage of the climb itself is just off the concrete floor or trees. But it felt undeniably bizarre to be walking through what was essentially jungle and yet catch glimpses of these towering skyscrapers beyond. We're almost there, I can see the building. And the view did not disappoint. Look at the view. It's funny, but most of the buildings I recognised I knew from Hong Kong's banknotes. In most countries, the banknotes are issued by a single central bank, but in Hong Kong, three different banks issue their own versions of each note. The Bank of China Tower is the most iconic building on the skyline, this modern and jagged, instantly recognisable tower. Just as iconic is the HSBC building, but I could only just make it out, hidden behind other buildings. The Standard Chartered Bank building, however, was all but fully blocked. I could only see the teeniest tiniest tip. The other two standout buildings were the Towering Glass International Finance Centre, and then the even taller and confusingly named International Commerce Centre. But Hong Kong is home to over 1,500 skyscrapers, and I've only listed five. The skyline as a whole was breathtakingly impressive, and it only got more so as darkness set in, and the buildings came to life with wonderful light. It was strange to have gone from believing we were travelling to Myanmar in the morning, to the stress and uncertainty of the airport, to now, this euphoric high where we were at the top of the world and nothing else mattered, mesmerised by the metropolis illuminated before our eyes. So this is the queue to get the tram down, so it looks like we're going to be walking. It probably shouldn't surprise you that the guy who turns up to the airport four hours early always carries a head torch in his bag. We came prepared. Again, it just felt surreal to be here. Normally when you plan a trip, it's a few weeks or months in advance. But here we were dropped slap bang in the middle of Hong Kong after only booking the flights a couple of hours earlier. Everything looks super spooky in the dark. But our unintentional spontaneity had some less savoury side effects. Allow me to introduce you to mistake number two. Back at the airport after messing up with the visas, we had precisely 10 minutes of Wi-Fi remaining in which to find and book flights in a hotel. Whilst I booked the flights, Danielle set about finding accommodation, and Hong Kong is very expensive, but somehow she struck gold and found this incredibly cheap hotel right in the city centre. But let's just say there was a reason for that. This is Chungking Mansions, Hong Kong's very own house of horrors. And before we go inside, I just want to share with you a review of this place that eloquently sums up what we're about to experience. If hell exists, then I'd imagine it resembles something like Chungking Mansions. I spent one night here and it will haunt me for the rest of my days. Once you get through the army of people pestering you and occasionally even physically grabbing you in the lobby, it's into a two-storey maze of fake mobile phone shops, foreign exchange bureaus and Indian food stalls. This is Hong Kong's go-to place for counterfeit electronics and passports, and for many other criminal goods and services too, if you know what I mean. 
The building is divided into five separate blocks, each serviced by two lifts, and each home to about 30 or 40 individual hotels as they like to call themselves, with close to 200 spread across the entire building. This usually results in huge queues at the lifts, although the one piece of advice everyone seems to offer online is to never, ever, ever take the stairs. That's where all the really bad stuff happens. The entrance to our particular hotel rather resembled a bank vault, and our room rather resembled a prison cell. This is the bathroom, although it's more of a cupboard. We've got the toilet, and the shower is directly above the toilet. So we're going to have to remember to move this when we shower, or it'll get ruined. We've got a super small sink, and then this, oh, I'm not really sure that is. Whatever it is, it's solid. Well, it was certainly very unique. In all honesty, it wasn't that bad. I didn't ever feel too unsafe, especially once we were in the room itself. The only worry I did have was about fire safety. The wiring didn't exactly look up to scratch. I tried googling the building to reassure myself, but upon reading its terrifying Wikipedia page, I learned there was a pretty horrific fire here in the late 80s that killed a tourist. It's okay, I didn't plan on sleeping that night anyway. So the next day, we thought we'd go somewhere a little happier to cheer ourselves up. Hong Kong Disneyland. Now Disneyland has its own dedicated metro line, with possibly the coolest trains I've ever seen. My apologies to all the actual train enthusiasts who are shaking their heads right now, but just look at the shape of the windows, and the handrails. And what's more, these trains run automatically without drivers, or maybe it's magic. Whatever it was, we were certainly very excited. The castle was a bit on the small side, almost laughably so. Since our visit, they've announced a huge renovation, turning it into something significantly more impressive and centrepiece worthy, and construction is underway as we speak. It must have been that strongly worded letter I wrote to Mickey Mouse. But the rest of the park was just as wonderful as any Disneyland. We went on Grizzly Gulch, a sort of cross between Thunder Mountain and Expedition Everest, and then explored Mystic Manor, Hong Kong's reimagining of the Haunted Mansion. The building was beautiful and the ride excellent, taking us on a tour of an adventurer's private collection of artefacts. When his pet monkey accidentally releases a curse, the exhibits come to life in a magical spectacle. There was Toy Story Land with a parachute drop ride, a slinky dog carousel, and an RC racer ride. And then we went on It's a Small World, which might drive a lot of people mad, but Danielle's evidently pretty fond of. Next we entered Tomorrowland, where we rode the Star Wars themed Space Mountain a total of eight times because there was no queue. We just had a really great day, something completely different to the chaos and stress that travelling can sometimes bring. And being there reminded us that Christmas was just around the corner, something that had slipped our minds after a month in tropical Thailand. After watching the nighttime parade and fireworks, we headed back to the real world of scary hotels. Our time in Hong Kong really seemed to fly by. We didn't really have a lot of money, so didn't do all that many actual activities, just wandered around getting lost and sightseeing. We saw the famous Bruce Lee statue, got an ice cream from an exceptionally small McDonald's, although apparently it isn't the world's smallest, and watched the Victoria Harbour light show, A Symphony of Lights. Due to our lack of money, we mostly lived off instant noodles, although these were a million times better than the ones they sell in the UK. The supermarkets had two or three full-length aisles dedicated to noodles, and they were genuinely very tasty. And on our final day, we caught the metro out to Lantau Island. So I made it onto the train, but Daniel didn't. From there, we took a bus up into the mountains. You can just about see it on top of the mountains. This is the Tiantan Buddha, or Big Buddha as it's affectionately known, a gigantic bronze statue that sits atop a lotus atop a mountain. It's freezing up here, it's so cold. This is the first time in about a month and a half we've had to wear jumpers. That's a lie. If you rewind to 3 minutes 29 seconds, you can clearly see me wearing the jumper in question. My point still stands though, it was colder than we'd been for months. The Buddha was simply enormous, framed against a magnificent backdrop of Phoenix Mountain, and I couldn't help but feeling small. 
to the sides were six smaller bronze statues, offering gifts to the Buddha and symbolizing the six perfections necessary for enlightenment. We also walked around the neighboring Polin Monastery. I think this cow is going to try and steal some food. He's making his mind up which one he wants. Oh, he's going for it, he's going for it. There he goes. And that was the end of our time in Hong Kong and our time in Asia as a whole. As we took off that evening, we flew over Disneyland, which was super cool to see from the air. And then after four hours, we could see the Petronas Towers out the window as we landed in Kuala Lumpur. Unfortunately, this would just be a short layover and we couldn't leave the airport, but I fully intend to return to the city someday soon. From there, it was eight hours to Australia's Gold Coast for another very brief layover before the final leg across to New Zealand. We were about to embark on our biggest adventure yet.